Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. What a beautiful day it is to be back in the house of the Lord. Are we just not going to waste any time? Just go ahead and get ready to worship the name of the Lord. If you guys want to stand with us, we appreciate you guys being ready to worship with us. If you guys are watching on the stream, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Let's go ahead and let's praise the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's go speak. You guys stop with us this morning. We sing your praise. in here know with the Lord that the God that we serve he's awesome and he's mighty and he's holy and he's pure and he's, he's an intimate and relational God if you guys sing this out with us this morning we just want to invite the holy presence into the, into the house this morning we sing who can stop the Lord who can stop the Lord almighty who can stop the Lord almighty no one who can stop the Lord? No one can stop the Lord. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one. Who can stop the Lord Almighty?
the Lord Almighty. Amen. You're worthy, Amen. God. You are worthy. Worthy, Jesus. Let your spirit come, Jesus. Are you hurting, broken within? Yes. Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the world? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, your precious blood, Jesus. Behind your regrets and mistakes, come today. There's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. See, come to the altar. sounds so beautiful out there. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing alleluia, Christ is risen. Let's shout the praises to the heavens this morning. Let's sing it. Oh, what a
The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was but with The precious blood of Jesus Christ We're going to bring some energy in the house of the Lord this morning A little bit of energy We raise a hallelujah Jesus, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Can we clap that? Can we clap that with some intent? I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Never, never comes to fight for me. I'm about to see, I'm about to see in the middle of the
Right. Good morning. Welcome to TAB. How are you this morning? Everybody good? Yes. Well, I am Bethany, and if I have not had a chance to meet you, I would love to do that today after service, out in the atrium, in here, wherever. You'll just have to catch me because I'm always on the go. But um, you can go ahead and take a seat. Go ahead and take a seat. Get comfortable. But we want to say a special welcome this morning to all the fathers in the house. <laughs> Woohoo! Online, if you're watching, good morning. We love you. I'm Craig's wife. So happy Father's Day to you. We love you. And then there's three special ones online that we want to say happy Father's Day to, and that's Pop, Pappy, and Papa T. Yeah, Pop, Pappy, and Pappy, whatever. You know who you, know who you are. We love you. Um, but we are so excited you're here this morning with us. There's a couple of things I just want to give you a little bit of information about. As you're heading out, dads, we're doing a barbecue, so make sure you grab a skewer full of some really yummy, tasty meats out there. We also have a fun little gift for you, just to say we love you and thanks. Um, so we've got that going on, but then you've probably heard that we have several different ways to connect at TAB. And one of them is through the regular connection card in the back of your pew. You can fill that out, put it in our baskets in the back. We also collect offering back there as well. But then you might have heard us say, do the QR code, do the QR code. And if you're like my husband, he's like, what's a QR code? Well, so I'm gonna walk you through it just real quick. On the back of your pew, you'll find these little forms there's three different, these are QR codes, these fun little digitized things. And you'll see it says connect, pray, and give. And so, and how do we use that? So your phone, pull up the camera, okay? And then you're just going to place it on the QR code. And I don't know if you can see it, but it'll pop up a little link at the top, take you to Safari, and it'll bring it straight up, a little form, okay? So, for all of those that are us that are technically inclined or not inclined, yeah, that's it. That's the way you do it, okay? Um, but if you have any questions, if in doubt, find somebody, ask. We'd love to help you. We wanna pray for you. We wanna connect with you. Um, the connection link is a great way to sign up for our weekly emails. That's where you get all of the details, all of the information that comes straight to your inbox, okay? So real quick, I'm gonna pray us through. I'm gonna pray for the dads, um, and then we're gonna get going with our service. So Father God, we love you, Lord. We thank you so much for today. We thank you that you give us the opportunity to gather together in your presence and um, to just join in worship and to just bring honor and glory to you. God, I thank you for all of the fathers in the building, whatever that looks like for them, whether that is currently, whether that's they've got the older ones, whether they're grandfathers, father, or even if they're just a father figure to somebody else. I thank you for them. I praise you for them. And I thank you for just what you've done through them to impact your kingdom. And so, Lord, as we just kick off Father's Day and we dig deeper into your word, I pray that you would just speak to each one of the dads online, in person, wherever they are, and help them to know that they're loved and they're seen. We just love you and we thank you. All right, so we're going to turn our attention to the screens and then get going with the service. Enjoy.
right, well, good morning. How's everybody doing out there? Yes. Man, I have to say, that's the, that's the prettiest uh, service host I've ever laid eyes on. So, uh, my goodness, I'm trying to focus again. So, what am I doing up here? Oh, yeah, preaching the message. All right. Well, uh, I'm Pastor Craig. If I hadn't had a chance to meet you, uh, I am excited to have that opportunity and uh, look forward to connecting with you as well. And uh, we've got some special guests in the house today, so we're going to do like a big thing at the end of the service. But... Uh, before we kick off, we just want to say thank you to Triple R Ranch is in the house today. Yes. And uh, we want to be committed to praying for all of you over these next several months. I know God's got great things in store. And uh, I just hear so many stories of through the years how God uses summer camp in a unique way to really change the trajectory of the next generation's lives. So we want to be praying for that to happen and uh, praying for the staff this summer as they just go all out uh, serving the Lord. And uh, it's an honor to have you today. For those of you that are joining in online, we want to welcome you uh, as well today. Thank you for being a part. And uh, first time guest, always an honor to have you. Thank you for taking that step to come. Uh, that's not something that we take lightly. I know it takes a lot of courage to come and to try uh, a new place. And so we're excited and honored to have you today as well. Well, we're continuing on in our sermon series over the last several weeks. We've been looking at this idea of identity, right? We've talked about in our, in our culture as a whole, it just seems like nowadays that we're in a, a bit of an identity crisis in, in so many Ways people are, are grasping after this or that really as, uh, as the core identity, right? And we've said that, no, that God has created us in the image of God. And we've, there's a reason why we've gone back to Genesis 1 and 2 every single week to really see what was God's ideal plan, right? He's got a good plan and a purpose for our lives. He designed us with good intentions in mind, right? We get the opportunity as his creation to reflect the creator in a unique way. As scripture says that we're not God, we're not little gods, but we are created in the image of God. And there's a likeness about us, right, that reflects our good and beautiful creator. And so when we have wrestled and we've talked about our identity, right, we've looked at some of these difficult, challenging topics in our world today that it seems like, you know, oftentimes we want to grab after aspects or things that are actually a part of the creation to build an identity on. And when we do that, none of those things are designed to bear that Wait, and we end up in all kind of difficulties and challenges. So if you missed some of the, the messages, I want to encourage you to go back and take a look. We've talked about race. We've talked about success. Uh, last week, we talked about gender and sexuality. So go back and, and check those out. Today, we're going to be talking about the idea of how does our religion, right, how does our religion, the expression of our faith, what kind of relationship should our religion play with our identity, right? How do those things interact? And just like we've, we've been doing, we're going to go back to Genesis 1 and 2 and spend a substantial amount of time there. And the reason why we've done that is because uh, I, I've heard this to be the case. I know we've got a lot of people in uh, that work in different government offices and things like that, so you can, you can fact check me if you want. But I've heard uh, that, um, like, so, uh, not Social Security agents, those aren't, those aren't really a thing, right? I don't think so. Uh, secret Service agents, the other SS people, right? I've heard that when it comes to, like, counterfeit money and really... Uh, really knowing and, and uh, being able to identify counterfeit money that's, uh, that these agents, they don't spend the, the bulk of their time looking at all the different forms of counterfeit money that's out there. They spend the bulk of their time looking at the real McCoy, right? If they can identify and they know 
what the genuine article looks like, then that helps them to determine when something is off or something's out of kilter. So that's exactly the approach that we've taken over the course of this series. We've been going back to Genesis 1 and 2 and trying to unpack that for all that it's worth to try to see what was God's design? What was the original intent? And that's been the the launching point for us. So I invite you this morning, let's go ahead and and turn back uh, to Genesis chapter 1. That's where we've been camping out uh, a lot and starting these off. And so we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1, and uh, we're going to read verses 26 through 28. And uh, it's going to This message today is going to take some twists and turns a little bit, but hang in there, and I'm confident that at the end, the good Lord will bring it all together. All right? Sounds good? Just got to hang in there with me today. Cool? All right, let's dive in. Uh, Verse 26, it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. 27. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. Now, if you paid attention to those verses, there, there's a lot of redundancy in those verses verses in those three verses right and we talked about even last week how the heart of that particular passage God wants to be clear right God created God created God created and there's on each side of of that verse right it talks about our instructions as humanity and then on the other side again it talks about our instructions as humanity right and it's not that God has a short-term memory right? That's not what it's about. We are the ones that have a short-term memory, right? If you're like me, I've got a, I've kind of got a thick skull. Takes, takes a little bit to, to get stuff in and out. And I think God knows that in our, in our human flesh, right, there is a point to the redundancy that God gives us, right, in in these verses. And we've talked about, in the very first message, we talked about being made in the image of God. We unpacked that. We said it's not so much the, the physical attributes of humanity, right, because God exists outside of time and space. God is spirit. So can't be talking about physical attributes of the human race. We talked about these non-physical attributes, that it's actually these characteristics of humanity that we get to reflect. We are unique, set apart from all the rest of creation, that we have an opportunity to reflect the character of God in a unique way over the rest of creation. And we talked about a couple different aspects of that. But the one that I want us to pull out today and really focus on is this idea that before sin entered the world, God's good and perfect plan, when we go back and we look at Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and we see the original intent and design, that God gave humanity a degree of authority, right? And we talked about that in the first first week of this series, that God has given us a degree of authority that we exercise, right, over the rest of creation. Not in an exploitive way, that's not what it's about, 
But God wanted to bring us along. There's relationship there that God empowers us. It's God empowering us and working through us in a unique way that we get to express and and we get to exercise our God-given authority over the rest of creation. Before sin, right? The original design in the very beginning. It was never about us trying to prove ourselves or or us trying to check off this or that in a in a way to try to make up some deficiency of a good and a perfect God. Right? That's never what it was about. God invited us into relationship and he wanted to work through us, empower us to have an impact on the rest of creation. Now I was looking at, at a, a passage that I've, I've read it several times, but I just never slowed down, I think, to, to really think this thing through. And it's just a it was just amazing to me. I, I just kept mulling on it this week as I was preparing for this message. And it's in Genesis 2, 19. It's a remarkable verse, right? The fall doesn't happen until Genesis chapter 3. So this is, again, God's ideal before sin even entered the world. And it's a conversation. It's a, it's a um, you just see the... To me, I see the friendship in this passage between the man Adam and, his, and God. And it's just a beautiful passage. But look, look at this in uh, Genesis 2.19. The Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. I picture God and Adam sitting out on a mountainside. I I don't know. We have to fill in some of the gaps here. But isn't that remarkable? Like, think about that for a second, right? You think God just... You know, you think he got tired or, you know, this was on the, the sixth day, you know, and he's like, oh, wait a second. He was looking in the future and he's like, you know, these, this mankind, they're going to get to a point where they only work like five days a week. I mean, what am I doing here, man? I'm, I'm wore out. Adam, get over here and, and uh, you know, help me out here. I'm tired. I'm, I'm whipped. I need you to step in here. I'm all out of creative ideas. You know, this, this antelope thing walking across like... I don't know what to call it. Adam, why don't you step in here and try to figure this thing out, right? I don't think that's what was going on there. God was inviting Adam into the story. God was inviting Adam to exercise that God-given authority over the rest of creation, relationship right God wanted Adam's heart this was an opportunity for them to connect and enjoy being in each other's presence I actually am a a ridiculous nerd on some things right don't tell anybody about this but like I actually went through this phase where it's called etymology right that's like the study of word development. And I just got fascinated on how, you know, how words develop and, and all these things through time. And I don't, I've not done a lot of research on animal names and that, that kind of thing. But I did just as like a, you know, kind of a preliminary, just noodling in it a little bit this week. I was just thinking about elephant, right? Take the word elephant. And that, that's, uh, we get uh, elephant, it's from Latin, it's two Latin words that make up the, the word elephant, ella and fant, font, fant, I don't even know how to say it, however that looks like. But those two words mean 
arched, huge one. That's in the Latin. That's literally what it means, the arched, huge one. And it just gives you an idea, right, of God and Adam, and, and these animals are parading in front of, in front of Adam. And he's coming up with these, like, creative names and, and words to identify these animals, you know? I had a lot of fun with it. I probably took too much time on that. I'm sorry. But uh, it just gives us an insight of the relationship between God and Adam even before the fall. He was exercising that authority and God was delighting in that. It's such a beautiful picture. Now we talked about also how Genesis, understanding the original context of Genesis, right? How Moses, these are inspired words of God, but Moses was the one who recorded the words of Genesis for us. And we said it was a a unique time, right, in the nation of Israel, because as they were getting these words in the nation of Israel's history, they were coming out of 400 years of captivity in Egypt, And what's so remarkable about this, right, is coming out of a a pagan uh, worldview in Egypt, the the children of God had just been saturated in this culture that, no, there's not just one God, there's many gods. And not only is there many gods, your job as a created human being is to serve the gods. That's what your overall point of being on this earth is. There's only really one person that really reflects the image of God, and that's Pharaoh. That's the person in charge. So, oh yeah, by the way, one of the ways that you honor and one of the ways that you uh, serve the gods is by serving his appointed person, Pharaoh. And Moses is totally flipping that. And he's going back to the original intent He's like, no, no, every human being, every one of us in this room has been created in the image of God. That gives every person inherent value and worth. There's not a person that we interact with, period, that doesn't have the image of God on them. And it gives us dignity and value as human beings. And Moses is encouraging and he's going back. And he's going back to the original intent. Because aren't we prone to that as well as human beings? Aren't we prone to get into that mindset? Maybe because we don't feel worthy or we don't feel valuable or how could God just really love me for who I am surely it can't be that good surely I've got to I got to do something I got to prove myself I've got to show God that I'm worthy that I that I deserve this And Moses in Genesis 1 and 2 and and reminding the children of Israel, it's it's a reminder for us today as well. We are image bearers of God. And it was never about us proving our value and our worth or somehow filling in a gap on a good and perfect and holy God. Right? He didn't create us to to make up some deficiency. But yet we oftentimes treat our lives and our actions before God in that very light. But when we remember that we serve an all-perfect, all-knowing, holy God, that He's inviting us into relationship that it's in that posture and it's in that understanding that then we have an opportunity to reflect just like it was originally intended to be. We, we reflect that relationship and we reflect the, the power and God is our source 
And it flows out of us into the creation, into the, the opportunities that we have. Are y'all tracking with me today? Because again, religion, it's a neutral thing. And we're going to look at some New Testament passages in a minute as well. I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, don't ever come back to church. And don't, don't uh, you know, there is an obedience that we're going to talk about. Right? I know, I know some of y'all were just getting excited. I, oh man, what am I going to do sleeping in on Sundays at, uh, you know, at 1030? I, some of y'all got a little too excited with that. But uh, religion is not a, a bad thing, right? Religion, the expression of our faith is a good and a godly thing. But what happens, we can flip the script if we're not careful and we have to remember that God is our source, right? It's all about remembering the direction in which our blessings flow. That we, you and I, were always designed to be a conduit of God's blessing, a conduit of God's good and perfect authority to the world around us. Not turning back the other way, and making it a checklist on why we are now somehow worthy or God should somehow be impressed with our actions and our activity. God is, is so other, right? I was talking to one of our deacons this week that helps me like, Preaching every week is such a team effort, right? Because I send out my manuscript and I get feedback and it's like a, it's amazing. It helps, helps me. So for all of you out there that do that, thank you so much. And as a result of that, we were having a conversation, right? If we had a, if we had a swimming competition, right? And we said, all right, we're going to go over to the West Coast and we're going to have a swimming competition and we're going to see who can get to Hawaii, Right now, some of us might get a mile or two closer to Hawaii, but the reality is none of us stand a chance. And when you look at the big picture and you look at the distance between the West Coast and the coast of Hawaii, it kind of makes it a joke and kind of makes it laugh. Like, why would we even why would we even attempt and try to compare ourselves to one another when the end goal is making it to Hawaii, right? And so that's how we, we have to remember religion is a good and a godly thing as long as we keep the flow heading in the right direction. If we ever turn it back around to where not only are we trying to impress God, but we also are now using it as a mechanism for why I'm better than the person next to me, that's when it becomes destructive and when our identity starts getting wrapped up in our religious performance, we set ourselves up for all types of trouble and pain. Y'all tracking with me today? All right. Well, let's look, because I, you know, I think even in the Old Testament, you know, we see throughout the, the progress of history in the Old Testament, we, we, we see the law that God gave the nation of Israel. And so that tells us, right? I mean, obedience is no, obedience is no uh, inconsequential matter. But even in our obedience, and you go back and you look peppered all throughout the Old Testament. And I want to pull some verses out that I think really get to the heart of the matter, that the totality of the law, even in that, it was never designed to be a checklist, a checklist that we check off and somehow God looks down in the checking off of that law. Now, all of a sudden, God is happy or, or, or somehow we've fulfilled our duty in some way. Even the law in the Old Testament pointed back to relationship. Even the law in the Old Testament, it was a mechanism by which the nation of Israel 
demonstrated trust. Obedience was a way that they demonstrated, hey, we trust God's design. And when you go back and look, none of the law was, again, inconsequential. Right? You go back and you look and you see God's good intentions were always at the heart. But listen to some of these passages because uh, sometimes I, I feel like we can forget the intent and we can forget the heart of God even going back and looking at the Old Testament. So Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 15 says this, And now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you except to fear the Lord your God by walking in all his ways, to love him, to worship the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Keep the Lord's commandments and statutes I am giving you today for your own good. The heavens, indeed, the highest heavens, belong to the Lord your God, as does the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord had his heart set on your fathers and loved them. He chose their descendants after them. He chose you out of all the peoples as it is today. Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 15. Let's check out Micah 6, 8, one of my favorite verses. It says this, Mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what, is the, what it is the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. You see the heart of God just oozing out in those passages today? Even in our obedience, even in the law, God is not looking for us to just be robots, to check off a list. That totally misses the heart of God. The law provided clarity around what, what a God-honoring life looked like. But it all pointed back to relationship. The point was never to earn God's favor, but to reflect God's favor out into the world. That's the heart of it. All right, so let's, let's flip forward just a, a little bit. You know, you and I on this side of, uh, of the cross, right? This side of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We get to see God's full plan of salvation. We get to see the full picture. And I want us to read a, an important verse uh, that Jesus actually spoke, right? And the context of this verse is the Sermon on, on the Mount. And Jesus actually talks about the law right smack dab in the Sermon on the Mount. And I think it gives us a lot of insight. So let's look at, um, look at Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be in uh, 17 through 20. And it says this, Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. So this is Jesus speaking. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven." For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is like a, this is like a mic drop moment for Jesus, right? Because he just said, if your righteousness doesn't surpass the scribes and the Pharisees, you don't have a chance. And everybody on that hillside that day would have, their jaws would have dropped because, no, the scribes and the Pharisees, they got it going on. They've got everything figured out. Those are the people that we look to. They're the ones that really have it figured out. What's Jesus 
doing in this moment? What in the world? He, he goes on in the Sermon of the Mount and he unpacks what a God-honoring life looks like. Right? If anything from the Old Testament law, in many ways, Jesus upped the ante. It's like, man, what, what in the world is going on? But Jesus, right? We say it oftentimes, Jesus, God in a bod. God, fully God, fully man. Jesus came to the earth to point the way to the Father. He did more than that. He died on the cross for our sins so that we could be reconciled to God. But Jesus, as God, he gets to, if anybody gets to define the rules of the game, it's Jesus Christ. And he goes back and he points out what was missing all along. That the Pharisees and the religious leaders, dare I say we, can, get, can miss a lot of times. He goes back and he points to the essence, the heartbeat of the law was always about loving God and loving other people. It really is that simple. And if we make it more of a checklist or more about us pleasing and proving our worth to God, we can absolutely do that and totally miss the essence of what God's heartbeat was all along, which is he wants our heart. He wants our trust. He wants us to see that he has good intentions for our life. And so if anything... Jesus calls back to the heart of what God expressed all along. That in your obedience, that in our, in our trust and in our walking with the Lord, we cannot forget, which is easy to do, that relationship is at the center of it all. And if we miss that, we miss it. Well, all throughout the New Testament, right, Paul and the uh, apostles, they continue to unpack what this looks like, what a life of obedience to God looks like. And at the center of it all, again, trust, faith, Right? Am I, am I going to trust God that I come to him and my identity is already secured in Christ? I've got nothing more to prove here. I've got nothing that I can add. We say Jesus plus nothing equals everything because that's the heart of the gospel. That's what it is. But does that mean we just... Do what we want to do? Does that mean we just live how we want to live? No. When we understand what God has done on our behalf, when we understand that the living God, the all-powerful, sufficient God is inviting me, a sinner, me, a nobody, into relationship where he would then empower me through his spirit to make an impact on the world around me, why would I want to miss out on that? That's our loss. It totally changes the script, though. And it adds true meaning. And it adds true purpose and intent, where it's not just about my actions on what I do or don't do, 
This is all an opportunity for me to know the living God and to experience relationship with Him. It's a powerful thing. I want to end with this thought. And I want us to flip forward to James 1.27. I love this because it's, it's given me an opportunity to share my, my heart on some of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. But James 1.27 is one of, my, one of my all-time favorite verses because it checks me. God checks my heart through this verse time and time again. Because, again, James, these are inspired word by Jesus' half-brother. And he's saying, religion, man, knock yourself out. Religion is, is a good thing. It's, don't, don't throw, you know, the baby out with the bathwater. I think, did y'all say that around here? Is that, all right. Sometimes I miss on my, you know, on my little, on my little sayings, you know. But uh, James is saying, right, in this, it's not, it, the problem's not with religion, so don't walk away from, from this message thinking that. But here's what, he, here's what he says. It's powerful. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. You know, I don't know what it is. And I'm going to get on my soapbox for just a second, and then I'm going to end. And God help me, because I'm guilty of it. I don't know what it is about our culture today where, you know, if we don't get recognized for something, we feel like it doesn't count or something like that. You know, like, we, can't, we, we have such a hard time just staying pure on our motives, like we gotta, we gotta blast everything out, you know, from the, from the whatever, so people can, and I'm not knocking, you know, like, there's a, there's a time and a place, and there's a way to promote things, or, you know, we wanna, we wanna show, we wanna have, um, we want the world around us, you know, to, to see, you know, that the, the big C church it does make a difference in the world. But I honestly think that if we just left that in the hands of God on how he wants to bring honor and glory to himself, let's let God do that. We don't have to feel like we have to put that on our shoulders to do that. And I think when we do at least in my, I'll be honest and I'll confess in my heart when I do that, there's just a little, there's just a little piece in me where I want to take the glory that only goes to a good and perfect and holy God. And I just want to take a little bit of that glory and just kind of break off a little bitty crumb of it and attach it to myself. And that is wrong. God help us. Our job is to reflect a good and a perfect and a pleasing God, right? And that's what James is getting at. Because in the ancient world, everybody knew the Pharisees weren't going to waste their time on orphans and widows because they weren't even in the city most of the time. They put them out in the boondocks where nobody had to look at them or deal with them or know that they were even around. Let's just get them over in a corner somewhere and we'll just pretend like they're not even there. And that way we can go a, acting, you know, holy and great and we can reflect our religion and we really don't have to get messy or dirty in anything. That's why James says, no, if you want to know what true religion looks like, if you want to exercise your religion in a God-honoring way, I love what Mike Latsko said a few weeks ago. He said, God has given us a heart for the forgotten ones. And I, never, I haven't been able to get that phrase out of my mind the last couple of weeks. He said, God has 
pierced our heart to go after the forgotten ones. In our world today, let's, my, myself included, let's just face it, we're always looking ahead. We're always looking at who's in front of us and how can I, you know, get to the, and there's nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong with wanting to be our best. That's not what I'm saying. But I think oftentimes there's actually more value in looking back and looking at those maybe behind us that God would want us our privilege to learn and to impact and to do life together with. And that's what James is saying here. Hey, if you really want to be serious about your faith, go do something. Go, go get messy with messy lives. Oh, and by the way, don't let anybody know about it. God sees. We have an audience of one. Let's just make it our aim to please him and let him take care of it so along those lines the worship team is going to come back up to the front we're just going to sing a song of celebration we've got some commissioning that's going to happen at the end of the service that i'm really excited about but i want to challenge us this week whatever it looks like for us i'm challenging myself too could you imagine if all of us in this room made the decision this week to get out of our comfort zones just one time this week and ask the Lord, hey, what is one, what's one way that I could demonstrate good works, that I can demonstrate my faith in a way that nobody would even see or know? Maybe another life, a forgotten one, that maybe God would give us the opportunity this week to bless and to change a life through something that we might deem as simple. You know, God uses the simple things oftentimes far more than he does the quote-unquote profound things. So maybe it's a trash can of your neighbor that you can roll up this week. Maybe it's a conversation with somebody that you've been avoiding that maybe God has that person in your life yeah they might be this or that but maybe you're the person that God would have reach out a a hand and say hi and get to know the name of somebody because we've got forgotten ones all in our our midst that maybe God would have us be the one that steps in where others step away. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today and we thank you that we come to you in a secure identity in Christ. Thank you that we've got nothing to prove, that it's all a blessing and a benefit, Father, that when we obey, that when we trust you, God, you have so much good in store for our life. So, Father, would you help us this week to be bold, to step out where others might step in or step away. And, Father, we will give you all the glory for it. You alone are worthy. And we love you today. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
And we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit up, pour your spirit up. A holy anointing, the power of your presence. Pour your spirit up, pour your spirit up, pour your spirit up. Jesus, pour your spirit out, 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 pour your spirit out. Pastor Ed Haywood, former pastor here at TAP and staff chaplain at the Union Mission. And it is my great honor, as well as TAP's honor, to be able to commission the counselors who will be serving at Triple R Ranch, as well as Lydia Curry, who will be at Camp El Camino in La Paz, Mexico. I'm going to ask um, Lydia if she would come up with me for a second, and then we'll have her return back down. And so I'm going to ask the counselors if they will turn and face me. Yes. Thank you. Just circle right around. There you go. Great. So first of all, I want to say to you that it's a great privilege to be able to commission you because TAB started Triple R Ranch. And so many of us are connected to Triple R Ranch. My wife and I served as counselors there under the UDM ministry. And many people here in this audience have served at Triple R Ranch. How many of you have served at Triple R Ranch? You see, so there are many out here who have been impacted by that ministry and has given them a vision for doing ministry. And so you are in that long line of tradition. And Lydia, you are as well. Now, what is the difference between Lydia going to Mexico and these students here who are serving at Triple R Ranch? The difference is a plane ticket. That's, that's really all that it is. Because not only will Lydia have to negotiate culture by going down to La Paz, Mexico, but these students here also will negotiate the culture of those whom they are serving. And so we're so thankful um, that they are. And of course, Lydia is from our church family. And we're so glad that you are continuing to serve uh, the ranch down there in El Camino. Lives have been changed because you have been there and have served there. So thank you, Lydia. Lydia needs your prayers and your support. Lydia, would you return back to the floor for me? Now, I have a few things that I want to say to you. Uh, Shirley, give me my phone over there, would you? Thank you. I'm not going to preach, but there is a passage of Scripture that I do want to read to you that I think is important for you to hear. This passage comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Today is Father's Day. I want you to know that you are here to serve your heavenly Father. And if you want to please him, please your heavenly Father by serving him with all of your heart and all of your soul. Now, I, I want you to know something, and I want you to hear this, because this is very important for you to hear. 
this is a spiritual battle that you're going to be engaged in. And you have a spiritual enemy who will seek to either divide you, divide this team, or he will seek to corrupt you. And so God is calling you to a holiness, an unabridged, universal, comprehensive, uh, unhindered holiness, a counterculture holiness that God is calling you to. And you can only accomplish that holiness through his power. But that when you access that power, you will change lives. And there will be young people who will enter into the kingdom of God because of your ministry. That's how important your work is. And so we will say this prayer over you of commissioning asking that God would bless you and protect you and empower you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for each one of these young people that are here today. Lord, there is no mistake that they are here, that you have called them. And that, Father, you desire to lead them. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will empower them that you will give them grace, Lord, to do the ministry, that cause them to understand the seriousness of what they are doing, even if they are just cleaning pots in the kitchen, Lord. You see that, and you desire that they do it to your glory. May you be glorified. For, Father, you are the mighty master, maker, and mover of all men. Father, it is your desire that these young people hear the gospel and that they see the gospel in the lives of these counselors. Lord, would you bless them to work as a team? Would you bless them, Heavenly Father, to, to live holy before you? And we pray that your power go forth from them and that our community will be changed because they have had this ministry this summer. So, Father, bless them and keep them. Encourage them in their low moments. And Lord, we pray that their lives would have a vision for ministry for the rest of their life because of these few weeks that they serve here this summer. May it be so, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Thank you for what you're doing. God bless you. Tab Church, don't forget the QR codes where you can connect and you can also give. And if you're low tech and want to give, there are some baskets at the back of the auditorium for you to do that. Stick around. This is Father's Day and we have a Bobby Skew out there just outside of the church and wants you to be a part of that and fellowship and thank these students and Lydia for their service. God bless you. Thank you for being here with us. Go in peace.